Good morning. Welcome to the King Institute for Faith and Culture. This is our uh, last guest speaker for the fall, and uh, it has been a good fall for us. I'm grateful for the many people who help out uh, in the, the executing of these events. I have four announcements. We have a lot of stuff coming up, even though this is my last guest speaker. First of all, tonight, uh, Christina Lake will be speaking again on Frankenstein at the Bristol Public Library at 7 o'clock. And uh, that'll be a different angle on the story and its, uh, and its trajectory from uh, years back. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at the Bristol Public Library, our own Chris Slaughter is going to speak on radio adaptations of Frankenstein in the 20th century. So if you know Chris, if you don't know Chris, you should go 7 o'clock at the Bristol Public Library and see his thing. There will, it will include any, uh, a short production, live production, of a radio drama based on Frankenstein. This Friday, uh, a King alumna, alumnus is coming back to Bristol and he's holding a big gala event at the Paramount. I have, uh, we have 80 tickets to this for students for free. His name is Jeremiah Caleb. Uh, Jeremiah has done a lot of acting in Los Angeles since he graduated from King. He's been in a number of uh, shows and he's also been in a number of syndicated commercials. Uh, na national commercials. There's a commercial right now for Honda that has these cars that look like they're made out of cardboard and they all say things like blah on the side. And if you watch that commercial, Jeremiah's driving one of those cars. And he's a King graduate. He is coming back to Bristol uh, in order to raise money. He is, uh, his dad was an evangelist in India. He's Indian uh, by birth. And uh, he went back to see the work his father had done. He had moved to the States when he was young. And so uh, there's a 40-minute documentary about this visit called Coming Home, and that's going to be on Friday night. And I'll find out a way to distribute tickets for anybody who's interested. There will be CCS credit for that. Final announcement is that next Monday we have our final event for the fall. Not a guest speaker, but even better, our own Amanda Biggs, who is somewhere in here. I don't know where she went, or she took off. She's somewhere. I don't know where. Anyway, Amanda is going to give the fall student lecture, so that'll be next Monday. In any case, for this morning, we're here uh, for our final uh, fall event dealing with remembrance and hope as a theme. And as that theme has developed, one of the things that I looked at was remembering things in terms of anniversaries. And this year, we have an important anniversary. Hang on a second. making me do this. <laughs> I don't think you can hear me if I talk in here. So I'll pull it off, but there it is. Could you actually hear me when I was speaking? I didn't think so. <laughs> anyway, that's my Frankenstein mask. It's the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein. All of you taking Humanities 2 will read Frankenstein, a book which has important things to tell us still 200 years later about things like technology, creation, what it is to be in the image of God, perhaps, and what it is to be human. Well, when I thought about this anniversary, uh, the name that immediately came to mind was Christina Bieber Lake, because I was aware of her book called Prophets of the Post-Human. She's given a lot of attention in American literature to the way that people have thought about what would happen if we could transcend the body. And indeed, that's the, those themes are there in Frankenstein, as you know. Christina comes to us uh, via her undergraduate at Princeton University. She did her PhD at Emory University in Atlanta, and she has taught for many years at Wheaton College in Illinois, where she is the Clyde S. Kilby Professor of English. She's also written on Flannery O'Connor and has another book in the works now. But for today, she guides us through our remembrance of the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein. Please welcome Chris Lake. hear me? Did that work? Okay. Thank you, Martin, for inviting me and for a truly Frankensteinian introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm mostly going to be talking about the novel this evening, um, but this morning I'm going to scare you. I mean, it's just about Halloween, so this seemed to be a good time to give you a good fright. 
And then it occurred to me as I was sitting here, I don't think I fully registered the fact that I was going to be speaking in a chapel. These are some desacralizing kind of images <laughs> that I'm going to be presenting, so I apologize in advance uh, for that. I hope you'll forgive me and then somebody can come and pray for the place uh, anew. Um, but I'm going to show you some things that we can do with techno science this morning that's going to freak you out. But I want to say something very firmly at the outset, and that is it's important for us not to, to blame the wrong villain. And my evening presentation is really about the true monster of Frankenstein, which is Dr. Frankenstein, not the creature. Um, and it's a tendency of ours to become neo-Luddite, to say, well, technology did this, and technology is the problem, but technology is the wrong villain. And so that's one of the uh, themes of my talk right now. Um, we think sometimes that if it wasn't for technology, we wouldn't have the atomic bomb, we wouldn't have plastic surgery fantasies, we wouldn't be talking about designer babies. And of course, that's true. But I don't, and I don't believe that technology is completely neutral either, because it engenders a certain kind of thinking that I think is best explained by the adage that to a hammer, everything becomes a nail. And when technology is offered to us as a solution to problems, it becomes the only solution that's offered to certain problems. And that's where the interest in my research really lies, is the problems and the dangers of thinking of only technological solutions to problems. So modern industrialized nations have long practiced a way of thinking that turns to technology first to solve problems. You don't like your figure or the way you look? Go get you know, breast enhancement. You want the best life possible for you and your children? Just abort the ones that you think aren't going to provide that. You need to get rid of the pests on your farm? We'll develop an insecticide and on and on and on. But don't be misled. We are the ones making these decisions. We're the ones fueling the revolution and human enhancement technology. We're the ones holding the hammer. That's my topic for today. And I hope to uh, scare you as well as make you laugh. Let's start with the laughing part. I reviewed a very entertaining book called Frankenstein's Cat that illustrates how technology is being used to enhance animals. And here are some examples from the book. A researcher discovered that you can take DNA from fluorescent compounds in jellyfish and coral and infuse it into zebrafish embryos to make generations of glowing fish called glowfish. And you can buy these now in most pet stores. They glow in the dark. You really like your special pet? We've long had the technology for cloning animals. And there even used to be an organization called Genetic Savings and Clone. I kid you not. <laughs> that would clone Fido or Fifi for a hefty fee. Now eventually this organization closed its doors, but an organization called Perpetuate, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, continued the work, though its recommendation, since cloning technology is still very crude, is that owners just put Fido's DNA on ice until the cloning technology becomes more efficient. And here's my personal favorite. Do you feel that Fido is insecure about his appearance after being neutered? Worry no more. For a mere $1,000, you can get prosthetic testicles called, you guessed it, nudicles. <laughs> People pay for these things. Now this may seem to be a morally neutral thing until you think about the opportunity cost for that money, right? But people in a consumer capitalist economy are not encouraged to think about our conspicuous consumption. Why shouldn't people be allowed to do whatever they want with their pets, even though human beings are starving in parts of the world, is the thinking, right? If we're allowed to do whatever we want with our money in every other way, that implicates, by the way, every single person in this room, um, why should we worry about spending $1,000 for nudicles, right? If you recently spent $5 for a cup of coffee, you're implicated. If you bought a piece of clothing you didn't need, you're implicated, right? And believe me when I say I'm no better than anybody else in this room in making that kind of call. And it's worth just thinking about that every now and then, calling that to our attention. What kind of money do we spend on things that we really don't need when there are people around the world who need our help? But of course, that's not my point for today, changing our pets is not the main use of biotechnology today. The main use is for human enhancement, and with that application comes a whole other host of ethical questions. The central among them, in my view, is should we do something just because we can? Now, 
Albert Borgman writes about this, and he calls it the glamour of technology, right? A certain kind of way of thinking about technology comes into our brains and thinks, why not try this particular thing? It's never been done, and wouldn't that be cool, right? But as soon as you put the question this way, should we do something just because we can, we know instantly and instinctively the answer is no, of course not. That's not a good reason for doing something. But it's astonishing to me how few people ask this question. Should we do this just because we can? Even when those enhancements, such as you'll see, quote unquote enhancements, involve major surgery that's expensive and could be life-threatening. So that's the question that I'm asking today. So now I'm bringing you to the scary stuff. I got a lot of these slides from my friend and colleague, Reed Shushard, who really enjoys freaking people out. So he helped me with this. Here's Angelina Jolie, age 16 and 36 after her plastic surgeries. The reason why I'm starting my presentation with Angelina Jolie is because she is so often seen as having an ideal fa female face and form, but with this slide we can see that her face is not natural and her form is not natural either. And here I just can't resist <laughs> the Washington Post, I think it was, ran a review of um, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, and the opening line, this is the best review I've ever read, the opening line was, Laura Croft, Tomb Raider, starring Angelina lips and breasts, Angelina Jolie's lips and breasts, and to a much lesser extent, Angelina Jolie herself. <laughs> That's an awesome opening for a, for a review. But anyway, she's not natural, right? This is not a look that she achieved just by being born. So I want to explain two philosophical concepts that I'm going to be working with this morning. And they seem kind of confusing and a little difficult, but they're really not. So just bear with me. The two concepts are simulacra and mimetic desire. And let me just talk very briefly about each one and then I'll get to the scary slides. Simulacra is a word used by John Jan Baudrillard, French guy, to describe how an advanced technological society um, is a simulated society, meaning that nothing is truly real in a society that just goes by simulated images. California is his example of the most simulated place in the most simulated country, and Disneyland and Disney World are the examples of how simulated things are. You go to Epcot Center to see the real Germany, what you're going to see is what you think Germany should look like, right? That kind of idea. So simulacra simply means copy of a copy of a copy where there's no original that you can go back to. There's no original California, is Baudrillard's argument. There's no original America. Everything is just a kind of echo chamber of images. Okay? So that's the first concept I want to hold in your mind for a minute. The second is mimetic desire. This concept is best articulated by René Girard in his book, Deceit, Desire, Desire, and the Novel. Now, what Girard is doing, he's saying, in the world of simulacra, simulated images, that is America, what propels people to copy each other is a vicious trap that is not as simple as it seem, seems. It's mimetic. What people want is not what's best for them, but what they perceive as other people wanting or having, right? So this sometimes mimetic desire is called triangular desire because what we want is not what um, we think we want originally with ourselves, but what somebody else wants that we think we want. So it's like a triangle. Um, here's Joe down here and here's Mark down here. Joe really likes Sally, so Mark thinks that uh, he really likes Sally. But what this <laughs> argument really helps us to see is that not even our desires are our own. We have copied our desires from other people. We're not even authentically desiring. Now these two concepts, simulacra and mimetic desire, wreak havoc on people in advanced technological societies because these images of what we think we want are everywhere and we now have the technology to reach for them. This is an interesting couple of slides. <laughs> Growth of media in the United States over the years. Um, you, you don't need me to explain how quickly this has grown even in the last 10 years, the amount of contact with media. This is the growth of mental disorders in the United States. This is correlational data, it's not causational, but there is a strong correlation here. Uh, millennials, the people of most of this generation, the people in this room, um, are increasingly anxious 
and depressed. And most of the time it's attributed to social media and the feeling of comparing yourself to other people. And that is all simulation and mimetic desire. So those are the concepts at play, making people depressed and anxious. Now, it's also important to note that the interaction between simulacra and mimetic desire is complicated, right? It's not simple, it's complicated. Take the very well-known example of Bruce Jenner becoming Caitlyn Jenner. Everybody knows about this, right? This may seem like a kind of simple case of gender dysphoria, which is not simple, but like, oh, I'm a man, I really wanted to be a woman. But once you recognize who he's copying, Cindy Crawford, it becomes a little more complicated. He wanted to look, obviously, like Cindy Crawford here. That's mimetic desire, and that's um, simulacra. Now let me give you an even clearer and more disturbing example of the combination of simulacra and mimetic desire. In the early, night, in the early 2000s, there was a spate of quote-unquote reality TV shows that foregrounded plastic surgery as a solution to your happiness, right? MTV had I Want a Famous Face, and Fox, after seeing NBC's Extreme Makeover, decided to do Extreme Makeover of their, of their own and call it The Swan, okay? So here, I want a famous face. You can look like Brad Pitt. If you already kind of look like him, you can get to your looks you know, augmented to look exactly like him or close enough. And The Swan, this is uh, the ugly ducklings that were selected for being ugly. And then plastic surgery, a whole bunch of plastic surgery targeted in all kinds of places and therapy and working out and not eating anything. You can become and get to, you get to enter a competition to compete with other ugly ducklings who have become swans and then named the ultimate swan. It's the most disgusting thing I have ever seen. I have shown the first episode of this program to students in bioethics seminars and it's just women in the room are just crying. It's so, it's so bad. In fact, the first time it came on TV and because I'm so interested in bioethics, I was watching it, I was newly married and I, I was crying and my husband's came in, turn that off, <laughs> you know, this is terrible. Um, it's, just, it's that awful. All right. So this is the winner, by the way, this is the winner. Her name is Rachel Love Frazier, and the producer of the show said she won it because she was the one who, quote, gave herself most fully over to the process. I would love to believe that what Fox does doesn't matter, but the hard evidence indicates that they, these programs set a whole bunch of people, especially women, into a new trap of mimetic desire. The data reveal that during the peak year of these shows, which was 2003, there was a 44% increase just that year in enhancement procedures, surgical and non-surgical, and a 446% increase since 1997. So that's mimetic desire. Something gets put on TV, you think, I can do that, I can get that enhancement, I can become a swan. And, but there's no, what are you copying, right? It's a copy of a copy of a copy. There's nothing authentic. And I'm not done yet, it gets worse. Celebrities, you know, celebrity mishaps in plastic surgery has become a little bit of an art form, right? Like a bio, you know, like a web art form, internet art form, seeing these botched jobs from celebrities. Jocelyn Wildestein, I don't know how you pronounce her name. We have Barbie. Everybody knows about Barbie. But what you may not know is this anatomically impossible doll was first marketed in 1959, six years after the start of Playboy magazine, which, like all porn, lives in the realm of simulacra. If there's anything that lives in the realm of simulacra and mimetic desire, it's pornography. The birth of Barbie was significant because it was the first doll that girls played with, which was not a baby or a child, but the woman that the little girl was supposed to come before she has children of her own. So the sexually desirable little girl, right? So this changed everything. We don't have dolls anymore as things that we're like mimetically engaging with. We have grown up dolls. So it set up waves of mimetic contagion. One of my friend's daughter got Bible study Barbie. 
she wanted to throw it in the fireplace. <laughs> it's terrible. Now, it's well known that all human beings are drawn to imitate what society tells them is attractive or desirable, right? So we have people trying to become Barbie. Here is Gabriella Jurakova, age 18, when this photo was taken. This is truly grotesque. See, these are surgical changes that she's made to her face. And more well-known, Valeria Lukanova, who has apparently now given up the designation human Barbie, which she accepted for a while, but still keeps her boob job and her facial features. Now, you might want to note that we don't know the fact that it's impossible to tell whether these have been photoshopped only serves to make the point more profoundly. There's nothing real here, right? It's a mimetic contagion, imitation. Here she is next to the self-named human Ken, Justin Jedlika. So we got Barbie and Ken. Anime in Japan leads to the human anime doll, Anastasia Sifigina. And then thanks to my friend Christy, we have the human Disney character, Pixie Fox, who has spent over 100,000 pounds to be turned into Giselle. With the ears, the nose, the lips, she started with her face, then she moved to her body, where she had six ribs removed, as well as numerous surgeries to achieve the look that she wanted. And here's what she said about it. I want to have the tiny waist, the butt, big boobs, big eyes, and a really pretty face. Having my ribs removed was just another step in achieving that ideal. She had to go to India to get the procedure to turn her eyes cartoon green because nobody would do it in the United States. She said, this is something that I've wanted since I was really young. I really wanted to have a different eye color. I first heard about this surgery three years ago and as soon as I heard about it, I knew I had to have it. I said I was gonna bring you these images to scare you, but I don't want you to think something like, what a bunch of wackadoodles. I would never do that, right? And miss the point of your involvement, your involvement in my medic contagion. Do you go obsessively to the gym? Are you trying to be a size two when your body is telling you you should be a size eight? Then you're caught in the trap of my medic desire and simulated images. Do you wake up hating your body because of its imperfections, instead of praising God for your health, you're caught in the trap of mimetic desire, just as much as the human Barbie is. Don't think you escaped it. These images are everywhere, and our culture, our consumerist capitalist culture, is always trying to teach you to be dissatisfied. You ever thought about that? The goal of a capitalist economy is to make you unhappy with who you are. That's how a capitalist economy runs. What a Christian, you know, counter-cultural move it would be to just be happy with what you've got. Imagine that, right? So, let's take an even darker turn. I know this is really dark. It should be no surprise that mimetic desire is what drives the porn industry where nothing is real. So surgeries are almost always to look like what is perceived to be more sexually desirable. Here's the sad case of Lolo Ferrari, a po porn star who died at age 37 from complications of her 22nd surgery. And look at what she said here. I hate reality. I want to be wholly artificial. All this stuff has been because I can't stand life. I was frightened and I was ashamed. I wanted to change my face, my body, to transform myself. I wanted to die, really. Needless to say, this disordered desire and self-contempt and hatred fuels a burgeoning new industry of sex bots, lifelike synthetic robots that are designed only to give sexual pleasure. And here, this is really disturbing, is a man who goes by the name Dave Cat. Dave Cat bought his first doll, who he calls his wife and claims to have married, for $6,000. He liked her so well, this is his wife, he got a mistress later. And I kid you not, these people who are kind of in a club, like an internet club, call themselves idolaters. <laughs> D-O-L-L, -L, idolaters. Now, again, this may seem like a victimless, victimless crime, if you will, but it's ethically much more complicated than it seems. Like pornographic images that objectify all women, these bots do nothing to help people connect with actual other people 
Instead, they set up a barrier between the person who uses them and anyone they might have an actual relationship with. And I'm not even talking about a sexual relationship or an intimate relationship, just an actual relationship with an actual other human being. Right? Now, listen to the way that he describes his choices in an interview. Now, the important thing to remember, he says, is that gynoids and androids are like organic humans, but they would lack the qualities that make organics difficult to deal with. They would be pleasant, agreeable, non judgmental, aesthetically and mentally pleasing, and more. In day to day existence, most people have to deal with at least one person whom they'd rather avoid at all costs. The way I see things, your spouse should be easygoing and a joy to come home to in order to counteract having to deal with all manner of undesirables when you're out and about. I think the best way to reach that goal is through humanoid robots. It's like having your cake and eating it too. What's disturbing about this man is he has no concept whatsoever of how the kind of simulated intimacy is stunting him morally. It's keeping him in moral infancy. The only way, and we as Christians know this, that we grow as human beings is by having to learn how to deal with the foibles of others just as they learn to deal with ours. Marriage is one of the most sanctifying activities. It's a crucible, right, that helps burns out our impurities because you really find out about one another and the difficulties and the foibles and the things that are hard to, to look at, right? But to actually say that you've married the sex doll and then have another one as a mistress is to withdraw yourself into pure solipsism. It's narcissism to the extreme. Having a made-to-order bride that never challenges you, right? And like pornography, having female forms that are purely objectified and not persons in their own right harms all women. Not just the women in his life, it harms all women. Have I scared you a little bit? Okay, good. Now what's to be done? All right, this is the harder question. The last time I checked, a consumer capitalist economy is pretty entrenched in America, right? We're not gonna fix that. The glamour of technology is entrenched in America too, so what else can we do? And this is where my research has led me to look at mimetic contagion more closely, to look at motivations for human enhancement technology and try to find a way in there, okay? So let me explain what I've learned. The first thing that I learned is that the way that our culture has learned to think about the human body and what constitutes the good life is part of the problem, okay? The first part of the way we think about our bodies is post-human. We are already post-human. Let me explain what, that, what I mean by that because it's very important. Catherine Hales, who's a literary scholar, offers a great definition of what it means to be post-human. She says that the moment we used the Turing test to define life was the moment we became posthuman. So her book is, We Are Already Posthuman. The Turing test, if you're not familiar with it, was devised by Alan Turing in the 1950s, and it was used to test computer intelligence, right? So you've got a person here, C, talking to, via text, a computer and a person. And if the computer fools you, into thinking that it's a person, then the Turing test has been passed by the computer and you have artificial life, okay? Now she's actually not interested in, do we have artificial life, is that what we're going to get? What she's interested in is saying that that's what it means to be alive, is to be information patterns or communicating on a text that you can somehow determine one's consciousness, not from embodiment, where you were born or where you live, places or anything, but, but information patterns and data. So we are post-human because we are Gnostic, because we define ourselves by information patterns and stuff inside, not embodiment. Embodiment is considered bad in, in a post-human world. So why not change? You don't like your body? Just change it. As Hales argues that, that the body becomes the original prosthesis that's just there for us to change any way we want. And so you have no argument. Like if you want to be an amputee, there are people called amputee wannabes that they desire to have their legs cut off or arms cut off because they see themselves as more authentically who they are without those limbs. And in a post-human culture, can you argue against that? You can't. You can't make an argument in a post-human culture. That's really important. Needless to say, this is not the Christian perspective on the body and the soul. Second, 
Um, the second thing, in addition to being post-human, and since we are stuck in a mimetic mode, we are not thoughtful about what the good life should look like for us. Okay, that's grammatically incorrect, but you know what I'm saying. We're not thoughtful about what the good life is and what it should actually look like. Now, these two things, being post-human and, and not thinking about the good life, couple very easily with one of the great American illusions that individual autonomy is the highest good, right? If your body is nothing but a prosthesis that you can manipulate, then nothing about your birth or genesis is sacred. Since secular society would teach you that you are a biological accident, why not change however you want to? Technology is secondary and not a primary concern here. The primary concern is the vision of the good life that this technologically oriented society is pursuing. So here is what we've got. This is advanced industrial society's paltry vision of the good life. Personal autonomy is the highest good. Ultimate freedom to do whatever you want. I can do whatever I want with my body, post-human. My goal is to find acceptance, social media, etc., and I avoid suffering at all costs. Now, this particular point of view, and if you really think about it, I want you to take a moment and think about it, can only lead to self-contempt because you'll never arrive at ultimate perfect freedom and ultimate perfect social acceptance and suffering will hit you. Uh, and, and all that this will do is make you unready for it when it comes, right? But this is what our culture just accepts as the good life. Now, our writers, luckily, um, do not accept this. And not just writers of sci-fi or speculative fiction, but plain old generic American novels, right? And one of the best novels that I've taught that deals with this issue is by Toni Morrison. It's called The Bluest Eye. This was her first novel of an illustrious career. Ended up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, Morrison did. This is the book's first cover in 1973 when it came out. The novel is set in the 1940s, and its protagonist is a little black girl named Pecola, featured here, who wants to get blue eyes because she thinks she is ugly. This is largely because her own mother has internalized the view of the larger culture that to be black is to be ugly. If your own mother thinks you're ugly, you're in trouble. Okay? Right? No, I'm talking about. Pecola thinks that getting blue eyes like Shirley Temple will finally give her the love that she craves. Now, today's technological society can say, great, for $4,000, $5,000, you can do that. And you can. You can have the liquid that causes your eyes to be brown to be removed from your irises and have blue eyes. But Morrison's novel is brilliant because she shows you through the course of this novel that even if Piccola could get blue eyes, if she could alter her appearance completely, her problems would not be solved. Right? That's what this novel is about. That's not the problem. There are deep, systemic problems of racism fueling a community self-hatred, black community self-hatred, and fueling the little girl's destruction. This is a sad, sad story. But I really encourage you to read it because it also has a beautiful, beautiful image at its core. And the image is this. The narrator, one of the narrators of the novel, is a young black girl named Claudia. Claudia learns through the course of the novel, she's one of Pecola's friends, that she has been scapegoating Pecola, that she's been othering her as ugly in order to make herself feel, feel better. So Claudia learns, I am using her, I am making her look uglier and uglier in my mind so that I can look better and better. And so you know what she does? It's important to the plot to know that Pecola has been raped by her father and becomes pregnant, okay? Claudia begins to pray for Pecola's baby and to want it to live. Nobody wanted that baby to live. She starts to pray for the baby. It's remarkable. And this is, this is Toni Morrison. This is me fangirling, right? Pecola imagines the baby, or uh, Claudia imagined Pecola's baby in the womb. It was in a dark, wet place its head covered with great O's of wool, the black face holding like nickels, two clean black eyes, the flared nose, kissing thick lips, and the living, breathing silk of black skin. 
No synthetic yellow bangs suspended over marble blue eyes. No pinched nose and bowline mouth. More strongly than my fondness for Pecola, I felt a need for someone to want the black baby to live just to counteract the universal love of white baby dolls, Shirley Temples, and Maureen Peels. This is beautiful writing. Because you see what she's done? She's taken a baby that nobody wanted and said, no, this is a gift. And beautiful in all of her blackness, gift. So this is the answer to the mimetic contagion. Our imaginations need to be sanctified like Claudia's by a vision of all human life as beautiful and as a gift from God. And this is where the gospel is so salutary. It's right there. It teaches us that we're not here by accident. We have been cre created on purpose by a loving God who sees us, right? He acknowledges us. He already recognizes us. So we don't need social media to get recognized by others and get trapped in an endless spiral of simulacra and mimetic contagion. And if we think of ourselves as already having been given a God-created body and a God-ordained destiny, the choices that we make will look really different, right? We'll long to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and not false images, Barbie or other things that we think uh, look better that our culture has actually poisoned us with. So I want to conclude by sharing an insight that I only recently recognized myself about myself and the scholarly work that I do. And this has just occurred to me the other day. There's a way in which everything that I've been working on the last 10, 15, 20 years of my life comes down to a single verse in the Bible. We love because he first loved us. God loved us from our conception, and because of that, we have the power to love others, to love ourselves and love others out of this trap, this mimetic trap, right? And into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the way out of, of the contagion. So thank you for listening. Any questions, right? We're doing questions. Are we? Well, no? we no? don't have time for okay. questions. Sorry. They've got it. They're going to go to class. No, you did not. Okay. You were All perfect. Right. Okay. But we can ask questions if you're interested in Tadlock House. So if you want to follow up with Christina, we'll go to Tadlock, which is right across the Oval. If you're visiting us, please come join us. We have donuts and coffee there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I should have clarified that for you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, I, they have